Next on call, kidney disease. But then I went into the hospital and they said, oh, you have end-stage renal disease. And kidney transplants. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Welcome to On Call. I'm Tammy Watson. And to start our show out, I'm going to have to confess to a little ignorance. Generally speaking, when I think of the kidneys, I lump them in with the bladder and just think about them pretty much in terms of creating urine and getting rid of waste from our bodies. And while that's true, the kidneys serve an important role in other body processes as well. They play a part in controlling blood pressure, creating hormones, and maintaining certain chemical processes in the body. Tonight we're going to talk about kidneys and focus in on kidney disease and all these other functions that it does. With me in the studio ready to answer your questions about your kidneys are Dr. Robert Santella and filling in for our medical editor, Dr. Peter Reinen. You can call in with your questions for our physicians right now. Our phone number is 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, that's 1-888-376-6225. And helping answer the phones tonight are volunteers from the Brookings Health System. Dr. Reinen, in a minute you're going to give our guest a proper introduction, but first, Introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you practice and where you're from. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Peter Reinen. I'm a family physician in uh, Millbank with the Avera Medical Group, Millbank. And I got a call from our medical editor, Dr. <laughs> Holm, asking me to fill in. And so I'm happy to do that tonight. And we have a special guest who's going to um, help us along with the show tonight. So right. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, our guest for this evening. It's Dr. Robert Santella. Dr. Santella specializes in nephrology and transplantation, and he practices at the Avera Medical Group Nephrology in Sioux Falls. So welcome to the On Call program. Peter. Why don't you tell us uh, a little about yourself and your practice and where you come from? And Well, I come from the East Coast, from Connecticut, uh, just outside of New York City. And then uh, I, my introduction to the Midwest was uh, graduating from Creighton Medical School. And I went back to the East Coast for a number of years and then uh, saw the light. <laughs> Found Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Love it. Raised our kids there. I've been there, tw uh, whatever, 17 years or so, 18 years. Um, best place to live in America. Um, and I uh, started with uh, the medical school and uh, evolved over to Avera. And the rest is history. So practice uh, kidney disease and deal with kidney transplantation. So kidneys and the transplantation and falling in love with South Dakota. Mm hmm that's a good start. I was trying to, you know, think of this topic and um, wondering if there's anything that that uh, the kidney doesn't cover. When I was a medical student, the nephrologists were always the doctors who had the calculator because <laughs> it affected everything. So I'm I'm looking forward to you spitting out some hard facts tonight and and helping our viewers to understand about kidney kidney health and kidney disease. So we'll look forward to that. Okay. Well, we'll just uh, zoom ahead. We'll go to a quick bump, and we'll have more right after this break. An estimated 11.5% of adults ages 20 or older have physiological evidence of chronic kidney disease. 
In our first report, we're going to bring you the story of a kidney disease patient. You might say she's been through the ringer and made it out the other side. Diabetes, dialysis, transplant surgery, even strokes are part of her story. But he was already, I mean, he'd already been in the Janet Sokolowski is a former nurse, and she understands what brought about her battle with kidney disease. Diabetes is what brought it on. I've had diabetes since I was probably 32 years old. So after I'd had it for about 20 years, um, my vision got bad, and then I got end-stage renal disease. Now, I knew I was getting end-stage renal disease because when I went to the bathroom, the pee was foamy in the toilet. Mm -hmm. So if anybody ever has foamy urine, you better get it checked for protein because that might mean you have some kind of kidney damage. All along, Sokolowski understood the warning signs and the damage that diabetes can do to a human body. I went into it a, a bad way. I went into it saying, I'm not going to let diabetes rule me. I'm going to rule my diabetes. So I would check my blood sugar, and if it's up, I would give myself more insulin. You know, so now I have an insulin pump, and it's under much better control. Mm -hmm. If I would have had insulin pump from the beginning, I'm sure I wouldn't have got end-stage renal disease because the pump is so much more effective in controlling my diabetes. It really sneaks up on you. It's real gradual. You just kind of, are, you know, you get nausea once in a while. You don't feel just wonderful. But then I went into the hospital and they said, oh, you have end-stage renal disease. Soon after this diagnosis, Sokolowski began a grueling one hour each way commute to undergo dialysis, relying on her sister to drive. Three days a week, we had to drive to Sioux Falls for my dialysis, which was about three hours long. And Jane had to drive me, so um, she would get off work about two and we'd head out, we'd get there about three, and then at six we'd get done, and then we'd get home about seven. So it got to be a long day for her. Well, it was a long day for both of us. Sokolowski and her family knew that a solution to her illness could be found in a kidney transplant. Like I said, I have eight brothers and sisters. So we checked Jane, and she was borderline. So they'd rather not do her. So then we did my brother Kevin, and he was, he was fine. He matched. And we, you're supposed to have seven markers that match, and I matched all seven with him. So he was a perfect match. And I've had it now since um, 04 is when I got my transplant, July 16th, 2004. I'm born in July, so I thought it was a nice birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Janet for sharing her story with us. And doctors, Janet's story is a lot more complex than we just heard in that little bit. At one point, she suffered a series of strokes, which I think she did a great job recovering from. And she also had bariatric surgery and lost over 100 pounds in an effort to get her diabetes under control. And she said that if you have diabetes, one of the things you need to do is have a good relationship with your doctor and see them on a regular basis. Why is that such good advice? Dr. Reinen? I am just the host today, so we're going to pass this one over to the good doctor, uh, Santella. And first, what's the difference between controlling diabetes and not controlling diabetes? Why would you think of that as important? Well, in terms of kidney disease or any of the organ diseases that uh, diabetes causes, you, you can't feel if your, high blood, if your blood sugar is high or normal. People don't know if their blood sugar is 250 or 100. And it's much more dangerous to be 250 on a long-term basis than 100. And, uh, People need to see their doctors, get educated. Education is power with regard, in regard to diabetes. Uh, they need to know some of, the, some of the parameters they need to follow. They need to know what the hemoglobin A1C is, which is a measurement of the blood sugar control over a three-month period. And they need to sit down with their doctor and say, what is my A1C? What is my blood sugar? How can I get this better? And, and for as, a, as, a, as a nephrologist, <coughs> what kind of number are you looking for? Would you like to see in that A1C? Well, it, for a, you know, of course, there are two, two types of diabetics, type 1 or so-called juvenile diabetes. And then we, we really want the A1C definitely less than 7 preferably well into the sixes. So lower is better. Lower is better. But at least under seven. For the type one diabetics. For the type for type two diabetics it's a more complex disease in terms of the kidneys. For type two diabetes there's a lot more blood vessel disease and high blood pressure play, playing a role. So there's probably not as much benefit to get it under seven but definitely under eight for the type two diabetics. What, what does the diabetes do to the kidney? Why does that make a problem? Well, the, it, the kidney, although I think it's probably as important as the heart, um, had to get that in there, but the, the kidney is made of blood vessels, basically. So if anything that's uh, good for the heart is good for the kidneys. So uh, lowering blood pressure, lowering cholesterol, a healthy diet, staying trim, avoiding obesity, those are all good for the kidney. Probably the, the key 
parameter, if you had to pick one for the kidney, would be blood pressure, normalizing blood pressure. Well, let's back up and start with what does a healthy kidney do in the body? What, you know, so what, what it, it does what a lot. What does it do? Let's start with that. That's a yeah. lot simpler for Dr. Santella. Well, the, 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 most people know that the kidney gets rid of uh, fluids, extra salt, and toxins that build up. The two main toxin removing organs are the liver and the kidney. But the kidney does a, a lot more. The kidney is key in controlling blood pressure. The kidney produces hormones. Uh, the kidney makes vitamin D and it contributes to its key in bone health. One of the major problems with kidney failure is uh, bone disease, bone fractures. The kidney makes a hormone that makes the blood, uh, that makes the bone marrow make blood cells. So when the kidneys don't work, the patient's anemic or they have low blood counts and have fatigue and things like that. Um, this whole uh, collection of things that the kidney does between the blood pressure and uh, the electrolytes and such affects the heart and the blood vessels. So people with kidney disease have accelerated hardening of the arteries, more strokes, more heart attacks. That's probably the key issue. This whole package of kidney disease leads to premature heart disease. And some acid-base balance too. And I remember my physiology professor with his glass of lemonade saying, "Without your kidney, this glass of lemonade would kill you." Mm -hmm. Really? Now explain how, why, what, with, what's the kidney doing? Acid, it has to. It has to between our breathing and our our kidney, the balance of carbon dioxide and the amount of acid that's produced. And like baking soda, which is a, a buffer to neutralize acids that our body and the enzymes in our body won't function if we're too acidic, if we have too much acid in our blood and the kidney is vital in All that All the role. electrolytes. I mean, we eat enough potassium each day just in our food that if the kidney didn't get rid of it, it would, we would die in a matter of days. Wow. So um, if I'm trying to keep my kidneys healthy, I don't eat as much salt? Is that one of the things? Or? Well, in the sense that salt leads to high blood pressure, uh, okay. yes, but if you have perfectly healthy kidneys, you probably won't have too much trouble eating whatever you want within reason. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, a high fat, high calorie, obese producing, high salt diet is unhealthy for many reasons. I think one but, of our tendencies, don't you, oh, you can disagree with me on this if you want, but I, we always want to reduce it down and simplify. It's salt, it's blood pressure, and all of those things contribute or have a role, but is kidney disease a, a one-dimensional thing or it's multi-dimensional? No, it's, it's multi-dimensional. Multi yeah. multi -dimensional. And so how do we take care of that multi-dimensional aspect of the kidney? Well, f first would be diet. I, uh, I, I, I think a, a natural diet, and I'm not, you know, a, a, a real big organic green head or anything, but, <laughs> but a natural, I mean, less processed foods, more natural foods, less salt, more fruits and vegetables. The, uh, the DASH diet, dietary approach to stop hypertension, has been shown now to do all sorts of things, prevent kidney stones, help kidney disease, prevent hypertension, and that's a diet high in, uh, high in grains, fruits, vegetables, you know, fresh vegetables, uh, and low-fat dairy products. And it had less than two and a half grams of sodium in And then low sodium added to it day, helps, right. yeah. But, so, but many, most of our foods, our natural foods, are low in sodium. I bet when you say grains, you're not talking about a uh, loaf of white bread. Because... No, we're talking about whole grains. That would be a okay. processed okay. Yeah. grain. Less processed food. The closer, right, the closer you get to the field, I think, mm -hmm. is sort of the down and dirty rule on that. And then beyond that, um, taking care of uh, high blood pressure is key. And that's going to require medications. I mean, for mild high blood pressure, low salt diet, exercise, weight loss is key. But if a patient's developed, established high blood pressure, has to be controlled, otherwise the kidneys will worsen. And as I heard you say this before, but it's a vascular issue with the blood pressure or the inflammatory component of diabetes. And I, you're going to have to punch the number out of your computer there. But uh, it was over how many minutes the entire volume, essentially, of our blood circulates through the kidney? Or? Oh, well, 140 liters per day. So 140 quarts of blood per day are filtered. So it goes over and over and over again. Okay. Well, oh, I was just every so many minutes, it's the equivalent of your entire blood volume having passed through the kidney to be purified. And that's part of the reason when we talk about dialysis, which I think we're going to get into in a, a bit, that that's uh, not so easy on people to try and make up in a few hours what your kidney has been doing for 48 hours well, or would have otherwise done. Just dive right in and start telling me about dialysis and explain what what is dialysis. 
Uh, dialysis is an artificial kidney, and exactly. I'm gonna. This is one of the questions I had for the good Dr. Santel. But even when I was uh, a medical student some 20 years ago or so, we we used to talk about dialysis when a number called the creatinine or a, a, the BUN would get up toward 10. And now, and even over the course of my practice in medicine, that number just came down. It's coming down and coming down. I see patients now that are getting close to four and are going, and depending on where their course is going. But Well, it's a complicated question but, but it, to try to explain. But dialysis is artificial kidney treatments. Um, it, it, when people have get down to a little less than 10% kidney function, say about 7% is the number, then it becomes life-threatening. So that's a ways. We, yeah. can, we can deal with damage to our kidneys. Well, the problem is measuring built. kidney function because the, the blood tests are not, they don't turn abnormal until you probably have less than 50% kidney function left. So it's a little bit deceiving. But dialysis uh, takes the place of the kidneys. It does not ne do nearly as good a job as our own kidneys. And it, it maintains people for a while. Um, and if a patient is, a, uh, is eligible for transplant, which I think we'll talk about later, then the dialysis can be, should be seen as a bridge to transplant. People that, that cannot receive a transplant, then dialysis is the, is the alternative to your own kidneys, but not really as health providing as our own kidneys. Okay, so when somebody goes in for dialysis, this whole 100 odd, you know, explain to me the filtering and how much and how long and how that. Well, the dialysis can't mimic all the functions of the kidney or even enough of the filtering of the kidney. So um, most people are on, there are two major types of dialysis. Most people are on hemodialysis where we take their blood, pump it through a, a machine, goes through an artificial cellulose-like filter, and the blood is filtered, and the blood is returned to the patient with less toxins. The toxins are filtered out, and the extra fluid is taken out. But dialysis probably returns about 12, 14%, 12% of our kidney function. So it kind of just gets people by, and that's about as good as it gets so it's with not, dialysis. Not as good as a real kidney. No. no. You were overbuilt to start with, and we're not there. What? How do you determine who's going to get the? You mentioned two different types of dialysis: the peritoneal dialysis, or the the blood, or the hemodialysis. What, what would make the determination for you? And well, which there are type of some medical going? reasons why, if the patients had extensive abdominal surgery, they can't do the home peritoneal dialysis. Okay, that's okay. different from what we think of when somebody has to drive to dialysis. Right. So you can do a di dialysis at home. You can actually there are home hemodialysis systems that have come back into play these days. But the typical home dialysis patient has a tube implanted in the abdomen, and the tube is inside, underneath the skin and muscle, outside the bowels, and it's capped when not in use, and fluid goes into the abdomen, the toxins go into fluid, and the fluid's removed. Clean fluid in, dirty fluid out. And that can be done at home in various different different settings. Is it done overnight, though? Uh, the then? best and easiest way is to done overnight every night, but you're doing it at home. Mm -hmm takes about 15 minutes to set up and 15 minutes to disconnect. But to answer your question, the patient usually chooses what type they want. Um, there usually is not a medical indication for one or the other. If you had to have it, which one would you get? If I couldn't get a transplant, I actually personally would chose, choose home hemodialysis. And is the, if you're on one of these forms of dialysis, is the survival about the same on those two forms? The survival is, but the reason I would chose, choose home hemodialysis, we're finding that daily dialysis, every day, is, daily hemodialysis is probably evolving to be the best. But that can't be done in a center in a hospital. It's not paid for, the staffing's not there. We've had 30 years of dialysis of three times a week and you're only going to get dialysis three times a week in a center. If you dialyze at home, you can dialyze five, six days a week and probably do a little better. The studies are evolving where that's probably healthier. If we can make that work. But how, how long does a, the average patient go on dialysis, say hemodialysis? So for in center, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, the average time is between three and four hours. And for but how long could we expect the life expectancy of that person It all person depends on, on the cause of the kidney failure. So unfortunately, for diabetes, it's uh, maybe five years. And the age of the patient. Since kidney disease can be looked at as premature aging, mm -hmm. in, if, if you look at it simply, 
So obviously, a, a 20 year old on hemodialysis would live far longer than a 70 year old on, on hemodialysis. And these, so are, I, these are sick people, too. It's not like you just have isolated kidney disease and, and everything else is pristine. You're talking about people. Many, that some people will have isolated kidney disease, but 50% of, of, of the kidney disease is due to diabetes with all the ravages, the, the blood vessel disease, and the eye disease that go, goes along with uh, diabetes. Um, Another 25% is caused by high blood pressure, and high blood pressure causes heart disease and stroke and things like that. Are there some racial issues too with Yeah, much that heavier in our African American and Native American population. So the a much larger burden in, uh, in, in our region would be Native American population. Okay, we've got some questions coming in. A caller, female caller from Watertown. What causes kidney stones and how can, we pre or how can this caller prevent getting them? There are a number of causes of kidney stones, and the basic cause is that the salts, the electrolytes in the urine, are over-concentrated. So just like uh, sugar or salt will crystallize in a glass of water, if the water evaporates, that's what happens in the urine. And so the crystals form, and they become bigger and bigger and bigger and, be, and form stones. And you don't know you have the stones until the stone tries to pass in the urine and gets caught in the funnel. And then you and can. And then you know. And then you know. <laughs> this is pretty bad pain. I understand. <laughs> they say like pain. labor. Unfortunately, I haven't had. Without one. the good result on the end. What I tell people, my patients, is it's it's a little like what causes rain or what causes snow. Well, you have to have, you have to have humidity in the environment, and then you have to have the right conditions to get that to precipitate out. And it's the same thing in our blood or in our kidney. So if you have enough of the crystallite or if you have enough of the, of the salts, the. Um, minerals that they can precipitate out and if they're not flushed through so usually the number one way to prevent kidney stones that I was taught is just hydration drink drink lots drink, of water. Water. drink so um, the number one cause of kidney stone is a is an entity cause called idiopathic hypercalcemia that just means high calcium in the urine and we don't know why so it sounds really good. Idiopathic is a bad sign. That means we don't know question why. mark. And so in women with calcium with stones, 80%, 85% will have calcium stones. And the key issue is here, lots of hydration. Do not restrict the calcium in your diet. It actually has paradoxically been shown to increase stones. Really? Because so what happens when you don't take the calcium in, you turn on vitamin D, you absorb more calcium and you actually put more in, in the urine. So that does not help. Um, but again, diet comes into play, so a low protein, low salt, high fluid diet, um, and in fact, there's just a recent article published that that DASH diet with high fruits and whole grains and such does decrease kidney stones. Now there are, one, it's like any disease, diet is helpful in preventing and it helps mitigate disease, but if you have, a, have stones present, you may need other intervention, like removing the stone. Or you say, yeah. Same. If you if you if you have a have gained a lot of weight and you have uh, uh, obesity and high blood pressure, diet will help, but you may you will need medicines also. So it's not the uh, total well, answer. If that's the situation where it, you're going to need medication or some other kind of treatment for kidney stones, what can you expect? What what's going to be done? So what we 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 would advise the person with a first stone maybe to um, change the diet and I take a lot of fluid in and then we would measure the uh, chemicals in the urine so we'd look at the calcium in the urine and if it remains high despite that easy free intervention we might add medicines that will reduce the calcium in the urine so a typical medicine would be a thiazide diuretic at a low dose will decrease the amount of calcium that goes into the urine and will prevent stones. And you, not all stones are not stones are most stones, I think, 85% are calcium. Right, but there are other causes. Of and sometimes, so if you have someone who's losing a lot of weight or people who have cancer, and are, uh, that, that puts them at increased risk as well of that. So there, it's not, again, nothing with the kidney is so simple. <laughs> and that's why these nephrologists are so dang smart. <laughs> well, that's because you pick, pick the patients to send to them, right? You pick them out. Now, I want to ask, when a patient comes to you, how do you identify that, okay, you've got kidney stones? Is it pretty evident or? Uh, no, they usually come in to the ER at, you know, 1030 or 2 in the morning or something like that. Oh. And, and they are so in they can't bear the pain, anymore. pain in their back, radiating around to the front. They can't sit still. They can't move. They can't 
So nobody's going to tell me, oh, you might be developing kidney stones. It's once it's there, that's when you see it. Usually. Sometimes we see things like a little blood in the urine or something if we're just doing a screening, and then we have to look where that comes from, and we find some irritation of the kidney, and that's from a stone. But okay. for the most part, they show up pretty abruptly and pretty suddenly and pretty painfully. All right. Well, we'll keep moving on. When it comes to kidney disease, there are some people that make a choice and it's an incredibly selfless choice. These are the people who choose to become donors, undergo surgery, and give one of their two functioning kidneys to a kidney transplant patient. On Call met with a transplant surgeon to learn more about live donor transplantation and how it compares with surgery that utilizes a cadaver kidney. Before our next story, though, a quick thank you to our friends at KSFY Television in Sioux Falls for allowing us to use some of the great video they recorded during an actual transplant surgery. Dr. Tarek Khan practices with Avera Medical Group Transplant and Liver Surgery, and he has this to say about live donor kidney transplantation. Live donor works better or is preferred over a cadaver kidney because uh, it comes from a healthy person. And there is a very short ischemia time, meaning we take the kidney out and the donor surgery gets done in one operating room, it comes out and gets plugged into the recipient, which is in the other operating room. So the amount of time where the organ is sitting outside is less. On average, for both donor and recipient, live donor kidney transplantation surgery takes between two and a half to three hours. Khan says that last year, his organization performed around 10 of these surgeries, and he wants more people to be aware of the impact of this procedure. Once you get on dialysis, the longer you stay on dialysis, is uh, the more harder it is on your health economically and on your health as well. Uh, life donor, if we can have that, you don't have to be on a list waiting for a young healthy organ. An average wait time is several years before you'll get a young healthy donor. Actually, we would love a scenario where uh, we can get a transplant done right before you're actually on dialysis. We call that preemptive transplant which is much better in terms of overall long-term survival advantage. The actual health of the donated organ is one of the advantages to live donor kidney transplantation. Live donors are screened before surgery and must be healthy enough to donate, whereas cadaver kidneys come from the bodies of individuals who have started the dying process and who may have had underlying health problems like hypertension. Khan says that donors, although they undergo major surgery, do not have to go through an extended hospital stay. Most of them are in the hospital for maybe two to three days and then they go home. We tell them to be uh, just uh, uh, relaxed for two or three weeks. We see them back two weeks after the, the surgery in the clinic, make sure the incision healed up okay and they can be, go, they can be back onto their work uh, within a month. Psychologically, they feel very good because they have, you know, uh, helped someone and uh, helped save a life. So there's always that satisfaction as well. Each year in the United States, more than 100,000 people are diagnosed with kidney failure. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're talking about kidney disease and here in the studio, ready to answer your questions are Dr. Robert Santella and Dr. Peter Reinen. Our phone lines are open and you can call in right now with your questions about tonight's topic. Our phone number is 1-888-376-6225. Now, one of the questions that came in, well, let, let's wait. You gentlemen wanted to talk about live donor kidney transplantation. Yeah, I think right. That was a really important segment and that's a huge important topic that uh, allows a lot of people not only the opportunity for a much better life and lifestyle, but also the people who donate. And I was just going to pick the good Dr. Santella's brain about what he's seen and the difference maybe between patients who are undergoing dialysis versus people who have transplants. Well, I, I think kidney transplantation, or transplantation in general, in general is one of the true medical miracles. Uh, first of all, uh, patients generally are at best quite fatigued on dialysis, have limited life expectancies, and kidney transplantation just turns that around completely. Doubles to triples life expectancy. They almost immediately feel much, much better. Um, we see plenty of people that, that are unable to work on dialysis, and you know, young people, and they go back and they start working after they're transplanted. They can feel better, obviously they've just had major surgery, but they can feel better within hours. I mean, noticeably better. It's, it's impressive. 
Well, and they come back just so excited about that whole deal. And the other thing maybe we didn't mention about dialysis, and even though it is so important, but that day that you have dialysis is kind of a wash. It's a it's it's a tough day. How and then long the are next you day, hooked up for on the machine. Three hours, three to four hours. But it but you know you have to get in there, um, and if you, know, you have to get access to the machine, so uh, patients have a, a fistula or a shunt in their arm, a large blood vessel. So that's a half hour prep, and then you get on the machine, and then afterwards they have to hold the needle sights, and then they feel weak and washed out and tired afterwards. Okay. And even though it's, it's, it's a, a half a day, shift, it's yeah. a half a day, but but really it, it kind of fills the day. Yeah, so you kind of get half time while you're on dialysis and then they have this transplant and again that kidney is just constantly doing it bit by bit and better than the dialysis does so they come out of that and now, uh, they are happy people. Uh, let's talk about the donors. These are some incredible group of people. Those are heroes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think so. What risks you know, do they face? Um, if you're a healthy donor, they face very few risks. I mean, they have the risk of anesthesia, like getting your gallbladder out. Uh, they have a small risk of, say, a wound infection or something. Um, they're out of the hospital in two to three to four days. Um, we have them take it easy for a couple of weeks. Uh, they're almost always off pain medicine in a week. And if they, if they, if they do physical labor, then we have them take six weeks off. But if they're, you know, if they do what I do, they probably take two or three weeks off and, and can So there's work. a physical recovery. What about emotionally? How do they do after that? Uh, fantastic. I'm very impressed with the emotional benefit of donors, whether, uh, you know, a relative or a friend or occasionally we have an anonymous donor. It, it, it really, may, if you ask a donor what's the best thing they've ever done in their life, I would say universally they'll say my donation. I think, you know, there are a lot of people who go through their life and wonder kind of what difference have I made along the way. And if somebody's been a donor, they don't have to ask that, <laughs> that question. They, they know. And for those people that have received that, that is, that's uh, an angel or uh, that's, it's a huge thing. What type of questions must a person ask of themselves and, and be able to answer in order to go into becoming a live donor? What, uh, well, they, they, need, they need to be healthy. We, we abs the first rule in kidney transplant is never do a donor harm. So we want them to be very, very healthy. And, and they need to understand that while there's huge advances, this is not 100%. You know, they have to be able to handle this emotionally if the patient has a rejection or if, or if the kidney does not function. It does 95% of the time, but it's not 100%. They have to be able to uh, take the two, three weeks off, and they, and they must be healthy. We don't want them to have a risk of diabetes or high blood pressure. They can't be obese. They can have minor you know, medical issues. They can have thyroid disease or something like that. Does, but does being a donor put them at increased risk of kidney disease themselves later no, on? No. Young, healthy donors. I think that's a common misconception. People think, oh, if I do that, then I'm going to be next on the list, but it really doesn't. No. Young, uh, young meaning typical donors under 60. Um, so health... I'm young. Yeah. <laughs> young, healthy donors have normal life expectancies. Uh, we have uh, several studies of uh, tens of thousands of donors that have been followed now out to 30 years, and they have normal life expectancies. Actually, there's less kidney failure in donors than the general population, but we've hand-picked. It's okay. not that giving a kidney up uh, protects you. It's that we've handpicked people that have normal blood pressure and have perfectly normal kidneys to begin with, and they they have norm, normal life expectancies. Well, I had a member of my family who had an ultrasound done for other reasons, and she was told that she has four kidneys. She has two functional kidneys and a couple other little rudimentary kidneys. There are um, there are anomalies, uh, uh, congenital. Um, I wouldn't say defects, just uh, um, uh, double-headed pennies, you know. <laughs> uh, so would that person be some, a good person to be a donor, or would they be no, rejected usually, because they have a congenital lab? No, you know? usually the, the, if there's someone who has two, uh, three or four kidneys, the extra kidneys don't do very much at all. So there's a caller that called in and asked about horseshoe yeah, kidney, and that's along the same caller lines. Caller from Volga, a uh, gentleman age 51. Born with a horseshoe kidney, what are his chances of having kidney failure in the future, and would dialysis be an option? First, for the rest of us, what's a horseshoe kidney? Horseshoe kidney is instead of two kidneys sitting in the back, 
they're connected at the top like a horseshoe. And so it happens to do with the development as when we're in utero and the kidneys are higher in the body together and they separate and come down and sometimes they don't fully separate and they have a horseshoe kidney which is rare but of no consequence. It's not yeah, a problem. Luck. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. So is it essentially the same mass of kidney inside yes. somebody with yes. a horseshoe as otherwise? Yeah, and one of the things and we have transplanted horseshoe yeah, kidneys from well, the Dr. Donor. Santel also really? mentioned earlier that before you even pick up kidney disease really, the kidney is already down to about 50 percent. So you are way overbuilt in that, mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. So the, the kidneys function these are incidental things that you find sometimes along the way, but it has no bearing on stones or functioning or all these things that we mentioned the kidneys do. There can be congenital abnormalities where the kidneys don't develop well, renal agenesis or uh, small kidneys, um, and that can be a problem. Or if the kidneys don't drain properly congenitally, that can be a problem. We yeah, when we deliver babies, we look at their ears, and if they're, because they develop about the same time as the kidney, and if there's a problem with ears, on an infant being born, you're supposed to do scans of the kidney looking for problems with the kidney just because of the time in development that those, oh. that, that those organs develop and that's... That is, I learned something new today. There you go, that's trivial sure. pursuit, you're going to get that one <laughs> if you ever get stuck. Well, now, do we, I'm curious a little bit more about how the kidneys actually get damaged when you have, say, high blood sugar or stuff like that, but were there other issues that you wanted to talk about before we... Veer back to well. I wanted to get back to transplant at some point in time because well, let's it, go go right now. Let's well, it is definitely the preferred treatment for kidney disease. There are two types of transplants, as Dr. Khan in the previous segment alluded to: deceased donor transplants. Someone dies in an accident; uh, they are brain dead. And family, or they may have decided to donate when they were alive, and family decides, and then those kidneys are procured, distributed on a regional and nationwide basis. That's about half of the 15,000 kidney transplants done in the U.S. each year. The other half come from live donors. Now, 50, we do 15,000 kidney transplants per year in the U.S. There are 75,000 people on the list. The life expectancy on dialysis is short due to math. People are dying waiting on the list. And then if you get a kidney, you double or triple your life expectancy compared to being on dialysis. Well, let's, say I, let's say I want to be a donor tomorrow. How do I, do I call you up and say? You call the transplant center and say, I want to be a donor. And then we say, who would you like to donate to? And they say, I just want to do a good deed, which we occasionally have. And we first kind of look at you with a little slanted eye because you can imagine this type of calls that we might get. But um, we would put you through whether you had a, a desired uh, recipient or an anonymous you know, recipient, we would uh, first go through a telephone interview, make sure you're healthy, ask you the normal, do you have high blood pressure, you know, et cetera, do you have diabetes? Do you have, um, you know, pe people don't know and they call up and they really sometimes are, are not uh, candidates to be donors. So you go through the telephone screening first, then we get some basic lab tests like your kidney function. Mm -hmm. And if that all works out, then you come and see a whole team, me, the surgeon, social worker, psychologist, uh, nurse coordinator, and then we make sure that you are in perfect condition yep. in all ways, emotionally, physically. Plenty of time to back out. To back out anytime you want. Okay. And after a person's a donor, is there some pres prescribed set of follow-up? Do you That's get a, good a physical question. every six months? Well, we have a post-operative follow-up from the surgery at two weeks, and we check the kidney function. And then at six months, we check their kidney function. And then annually, we like to check their urine and their kidney function. You know, things can happen 10, 20 years down the road. Of those 75,000, there are about 45 people that have previously given a transplant because either 20 years later they develop diabetes or they have an accident or something happens to damage that kidney. And that's one of the provisions. If you were a donor, you go to the top of the list okay. after, if, if, by chance you would need a kidney. You know, a couple of our phone calls deal with one kidney or single kidney issues. A 78-year-old gentleman from Rapid City, can kidney failure be just one kidney or is it always both? In the case of kidney failure um, and you're on dialysis, do your kidneys still function at all? Or Good questions. So, um, <clears throat> the you have to have kidney failure in both kidneys. Obviously, you can take my kidney out and I can live a healthy life. If I've got so, kidney disease, is it hitting both of both them at the kidneys. same intensity? Both kidneys. Okay. Now, you can have a problem with one kidney. You can have a tumor in one kidney. You have to have that kidney removed. 
Now, if that's done early in life, which usually doesn't happen with tumors, then the, and they're, you're perfectly healthy, then your other kidney will take over. The reason we use, quote, younger donors is because the kidney, the remaining kidney will grow and filter more. So you actually won't have 50% kidney function if you take a kidney out. Shortly after, you'll have 70, 75, 80% function. That doesn't really help it happen with old people. If you took an 80-year-old patient's kidney out, the other one can't grow. They may have had high blood pressure, other disease, and that could be a trouble. But almost always, people get by with one kidney. So you have to have kidney disease in two kidneys. The second part of that question so, was... Well, the second part of that question was, um, do your kidneys still oh, function yeah. at at all if you have dialysis. Sometimes. Yep, sometimes. So you might be getting that little 10 percent Well, function, you know, if, if I have kidney disease now, I've developed diabetes and I try to take care of it and it gets away from me and over 20 years my kidneys fail and so at one point, like now, I have 100 percent kidney function and then when I, 20 years from now when I have diabetes and I'm going on dialysis, I'm down at 10 percent, 7 percent. Well, I start dialysis and I have some kidney function. It doesn't go away like that. But over time, and I make urine still, and I have some function, but over time, another couple of years on dialysis, maybe it just drops off more and more, and I stop making urine, and, and I, I might not have any what function. I was talking about earlier, that number that we used to follow, it seems like either because of accessibility or other issues, I think nephrologists used to wait a lot longer before they'd start dialysis. The pendulum is going back to waiting longer, actually. <laughs> this all comes around again on that, and on that previous question, there is for instance, when I have a patient who has high blood pressure, and this is going back to the very beginning when we were talking about all the things that the kidneys do, but we really have trouble getting that blood pressure under control. I always think what's going on with the kidney, and you can sometimes have a blood flow problem to one kidney, and that kidney will send out a signal saying, bring more pressure, that affects the whole system. And if we can relieve that blockage to the one kidney, or sometimes if that kidney's kind of been strangled off and it's not doing very much and they remove it, then the whole system does better. So it is possible to have isolated, besides tumors, but vascular issues. Yep. High blood pressure and kidney disease go together. Kidney disease causes high blood pressure. All kidney disease causes high blood pressure. And high blood pressure worsens kidney disease. So there's this vicious cycle that we are uh, we always try to break. We, we try to break that cycle and lower the blood pressure. This is just, it, the more you talk about kidney disease, the scarier it gets to contemplate dealing with it. Well, that's why these guys are so smart <laughs> because it affects everything. And people don't know they have it. You can't feel, unless your blood pressure is very high, you can't feel it. And you don't know if you have, you do not feel any different with 20% kidney function versus 80% kidney function. So that's the problem. Okay. So is like a, a first uh, minor step, like just making sure that when I go to the uh, go to the store, go stick my arm in that automatic yep. blood pressure thing, and yep. if you see have what a, it. If you have relatives with, with uh, kidney disease, you should get checked. If you have high blood pressure or diabetes, your doctor will automatically be checking your kidney function periodically. Okay. And then pay attention to it. All right. And ask your doctor, how are my kidneys? Well, yeah. Do do people talk? You know, when they come to see you in the clinic, is this like people don't ask about their kidneys unless somebody in their family had something? Are, are they like usually. me, where they are mindlessly thinking it's got to do with urine, and they don't make the connection to all the rest of the stuff? But if you have a, di a patient who's a diabetic, you will periodically check the protein in the urine and in their a year. right. We'll do that. Uh, and I'm just saying that that patient should say, you know, you know hey, well, just, how are my it's, kidneys? It's such a simple test. Even, even when we talk about diabetes mellitus, that's the diabetes everybody talks about. I mean, that literally means sweet urine or extra. And that's the way they used to test. Oh, boy. So Here's it's better, better to be a doctor now than it was then. But <laughs> yeah, that urine, it's a simple thing to test. It's oftentimes, you know, it's not very glamorous, but it tells you a lot. and It's, it's probably overlooked. We have a lot of things that we can do, but sometimes the simple things diet, exercise, eating well, drinking fluids, things grandma would have told you. Yeah. <coughs> there Simple are some tests. toxins, kidney toxins too. Um, and m many of those are prescription medicines that, that you, know, you wouldn't run into yourself. But the, uh, the overuse of the, uh, the, uh, some of the arthritis medicines like the ibuprofen, the Motrin, the Advil, the Aleves, heavy overuse of those medicines can cause and definitely contribute to existing kidney disease. Okay, we just got a stack of questions. I know the clock is ticking, so let's dive in, see how quick you can answer these. Caller from White Lake, her mother has polycystic kidneys. 
what's the cause and is there a cure? What can be done to prevent going on dialysis? What is polycystic kidney disease? Uh, usually it's an inherited condition and if her mother has it, she and her siblings should get an ultrasound of their kidneys done because once you have it, uh, you see Dr. Santella and it's a genetic condition. I don't know if there's anything to, other than controlling. Is there anything, if you're going to get it, are you? Well, first of all, a 50% chance. If, you're, if one of your parents has it, it's 50% chance in every child. Um, that's a direct autosomal dominant inheritance. There is no cure for it. There are some new theories that might help. Nothing's really come along yet. So, um, but, uh, you know, controlling the other parameters like high blood pressure. You would want a blood, the blood pressure to be perfect if you knew you had polycystic kidney disease. Okay. And I think it would be important along that line, too, if, if you've got a condition like that where you can kind of see where the highway is heading eventually, all the more reason to make sure you've got your other ducks in a row, that you're taking care of yourself, you're healthy, and controlling your weight and your blood pressure and all those things. Because if you get to that day where you need to have some type of a dialysis or a transplant or something else, the better health you are when you go in, the better you do when you come out. We have to turn some people down for obesity. Oh. They're, they're just too big to transplant, so. Okay, the kidneys just wouldn't be able to keep up with And anyway. the wound infection rate is too high. And, and things like that. a valuable commodity that you want that to really work. So there are people that, you know, I think, get off the list. Okay, um, question from Brookings, uh, gentlemen. His grandson has PKO or PKD. Will PKD, he, PKD. Will he definitely have to have a kidney transplant in the future? What is PKD? Polycystic kidney disease. Oh, okay. And you were just talking about that. And it depends. I, we would need more information to, to, to determine that. But probably it, there, are, there are different forms of inheritance of polycystic kidney disease. The, we just talked about the most common one, and not everybody with polycystic kidney disease gets kidney failure, but most do. Okay, so not guaranteed, but it's... It's good. concerning and we would want it followed. You, yep, want to be in with the doctor earlier, not later when you have trouble. Okay, um, a question from Pierre, a lady age 62. She's currently taking two blood pressure medications and having recurrent urinary tract infections. Why does she have to go to the bathroom so frequently, especially at night? Now, do I mean, urinary tract, is, <laughs> does that are, come into, do the kidneys come into play here? I don't think there's any relationship directly probably to the blood pressure, and there are at least four different issues in that that need to be looked into, and I don't want to just punt, but I'd say go, that one, go see your doctor, because there are a lot of parts that can go I, into that. I will say that the, the bladder function is separate from the kidney function. Off. So okay. people with, with, with urinary symptoms, frequency, et cetera, don't necessarily have well, kidney and disease. And then with prostate problems, you can also get an obstructive problem, and that pressure backing up can damage the kidney. Hydronephrosis, the enlargement of the kidney, which affects its function. So blood flow going in, obstruction of urine coming out, in, there's, there's diseases that happen because the blood can't get to the kidney or toxins. There's things that happen in the kidney and there's things that happen after the kidney and all those things can affect the kidney. But you said it's connected to every system in the body almost, huh? Almost. Well, we've got like 40 seconds here. A caller from Huron has been taking Celebrex for quite a while. It's a female caller. That's one of those kids. Okay, can this affect the kidneys? Yes, it can. So, I what mean, should she watch out for then? Uh, she should have her blood pressure checked, and if she's on long-term Celebrex or those type of medicines, her doctor should check her kidney function. It's very simple. Yeah, if you're on Celebrex, you might have an inflammatory arthritis, for instance, and that can also relate to kidney disease and other. There are other forms of arthritis that affect the but kidney. But millions of people take these drugs and a small subset get disease. It's a risk factor. It doesn't mean she's going to get sick. So does she go in for a blood test on a regular on basis? On a routine basis, the she just reminds her doctor that she's on this medicine and he should oh. probably, he'll probably check. How often? For okay. someone who has normal kidney functions, otherwise normal, maybe once a year. Okay. Once Depending on her age and other things. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we probably have like 30 seconds for final words of wisdom here. Dr. Santella, you Love your body. <laughs> no, take care of yourself. Eat healthy. Stay trim, exercise, eat healthy. And if you have one of these diseases uh, that are silent, that you don't know your blood sugar is high, you don't know your blood pressure is high, rely on your doctor for information. And I would Dr. say, Ryan. don't forget, if you really want to do something great and be a hero, consider being a donor. Absolutely. Uh, don't just do it on a whim or because you're having a bad day, but think long and hard about that. It saves lives. 
And then I'm always amazed at how many of these things we talk about. It's lifestyle. Okay. And with that, we got to go. Doctors, thank you so much. We will be right back with the homespun per perspective and then what's new in medical science. Looking for reliable healthcare information online? You can start with the resources link at the On Call website. From there, you can access a variety of accurate and dependable information sources, including the South Dakota State Department of Health and Medline Plus. Your two bean-shaped, fist-sized filtering organs called the kidneys, as the comedian says, don't get no respect. We take them for granted until they stop working. But there is more to these inglorious and obscure organs than you would think. Each day, something like 200 quarts of blood are pushed through the kidneys to remove about two quarts of urine loaded with toxins and waste products. But these guys aren't just filtering out waste. Kidneys know when to remove excess water when overloaded or to conserve water when dehydrated. They know how to and when to balance electrolytes and body chemicals. They stimulate the bone marrow to make blood when red cells are low. They, they stimulate bones to grow and to strengthen when needed. And along with several other body systems, they measure, manipulate, and balance the blood pressure in order to get oxygenated blood out to all the cells of the body. So what can hurt these magnificent, unappreciated organs? And, and then what should we do to protect them? Inherited and genetically caused problems, autoimmune illnesses, birth defects, aging blood vessels, infections, blocking kidney stones, certain medicines, and even environmental toxins all can cause kidney trouble. Of course, if blood pressures are too high, then kidneys can be harmed. But the opposite is true, too. That is, sometimes sick kidneys may be the cause of high blood pressure, making it hard to know which one is the egg and which one is the chicken. By far, the most common destroyer of kidneys, however, is a prolonged exposure to high blood sugar levels. Indeed, diabetes mellitus is responsible for about 40% of all kidney failure. And with the epidemic of obesity and diabetes in this country, we are facing a future where there will be more people suffering with kidney failure than ever before. The formula for each individual to best avoid such a fate has to do with monitoring blood sugar and blood pressure. And then, of course, living a healthy lifestyle that is to, that is to get regular exercise and eat a balanced, smaller portioned diet. Your kidneys deserve more than a little respect. We'll be right back. In our medical news tonight, last week during our show, you heard the doctors talk about the value of bike helmets. A study in Australia where legislation requires the use of bike helmets backs this up. Way back in 1991, Australia introduced mandatory bike helmet legislation. And as with a lot of legislative mandates, this issue is still a public debate an issue of public debate, sorry. But researchers at the University of New South Wales took an in-depth look at hospital admission trends for cyclists and pedestrians, and they compared injury rates from before and after the mandatory bicycle helmet legislation went into effect. What they found was a 29% decline in bicycle-related head injuries. And in other news, one of the obstacles to the treatment of liver cancer is catching it early. Current methods uh, include the use of ultrasound, CT, and MRI scans, and they usually find tumors only after they have grown to about five centimeters in diameter. And once tumors have reached this size, they have a head start on causing serious problems. Researchers at Brown University in Rhode Island have come up with a new method of identifying tumors, and in laboratory tests, they've been able to spot tumors as small as five millimeters in diameter. So now we're talking millimeters as opposed to centimeters. The new diagnostic technique involves using gold nanoparticles, which are extremely small and which were specially treated so that they could become engulfed by the cancer cells. These gold nanoparticles help the liver tumors to show up better on x-rays. 
the next step in this research is to take it to the clinical side of things and see how it works in mice. So it could be a while before this gets to the point of human testing. And that just about wraps things up for tonight. Remember, On Call is rebroadcast on SDPB Digital Channel 2, Mondays at 11 a.m. Central and Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Central. Once more, I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Robert Santella, and Dr. Peter Reinen for filling in as our medical editor tonight. Thanks to our phone volunteers, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. program is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television and by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota additional funding provided by Dakota Care the Brookings Health System Regional Health the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Post captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. To learn more about life and health, you can order your copy of The Picture of Health, a beautiful book containing insightful essays and evocative images by on-call medical editor Dr. Rick Holm and Dr. Judith Peterson. This book, containing health care advice, stories of medical history, and meditations on healing, can now be yours for $17 at the South Dakota Ag Heritage Museum. Call 1-877-227-0015 to order by Ag Bio Communications at South Dakota State University.